Hello, my name is Chris Benjamin, and I am the content manager and managing editor for Atlantic Books Today and AtlanticBooks.ca. And I'm really pleased today uh, to be doing the first video of our latest Voices campaign, um, which this one, uh, Every Voices campaign focuses on a specific community and writers from that community. So this time we're focusing, we're really pleased to be focusing on LGBTQIA2S plus writers uh, from, with, from Atlantic Canada or with Atlantic Canadian connections through their publishers. And we uh, are very pleased to be working with Tanya Davis to be doing most of the interviews, except this one, where she is the subject of the interview rather than the interviewer. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a bit about Tanya. Tanya Davis is a writer and interdisciplinary artist. She is based in Apequit or Prince Edward Island. And since releasing her first album back in 2006, she's been working mostly in music and literary performance, occasionally in theater, audio art, and film. She's released four records and two books, including a hardcover published by HarperCollins, of the wildly and widely popular video poem, How to Be Alone, which was a collaborative effort with the great filmmaker, Andrew Dorfman. Uh, in 2020, also with Dorfman, she released a follow-up called How to Be at Home, which was produced by the National Film Board as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Tanya was the 2011 and 12 Halifax Poet Laureate and the artist in residence at Dalhousie Faculty of Medicine in 2016. She collaborates frequently across genre. She writes poems and verse for animation and film, as well as live and recorded music. She creates and delivers content that is specific to organizations and conferences and events, and takes commissions occasionally for CBC Radio, the National Film Board, Canada Games, among many others. And she also works as a freelance editor, arts administrator, and project manager. So she is a very busy person. Uh, I want to say welcome Tanya Davis to Voices. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. I'm so excited for all of these interviews and to talk to you today to, to jump start. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, we've got some great writers lined up already and still working on a couple more. So I think um, those interviews are going to be really fascinating. Um, and engaging conversations between you and, and writers. Um, I wanted to start though by talking a bit about your work. Um, I recently uh, got to read your book At First Lonely from Eggborn, Eggcorn Press. Um, and I love the line from the poem, Fragility Understandable, um, which says, fragility stands under a thatched roof and gets rained on. And to me, like it, it evoked a lot of things. It could be a beautiful experience. It could be miserable, depending on the rain. Um, but mostly it sounded like something that one could live through and still be okay. And a lot of your poetry and music seems to really strike that note of reassurance that it's okay to be vulnerable. Um, like the other line uh, from The Tear is a Word, which says, how soon do you feel your first heartache? So acknowledging, you know, this is a universal experience. We all go through it yeah. and it's okay to be yourself. I wondered if you could talk a bit about that theme uh, in your work and your own perspective on it. Sure. Yeah, I um, I've written about that a lot of times. Um, it is a constant thing I, I return to the, the themes of fragility, vulnerability, um, and the sort of aches that come with that. I do also think there are lots of joys that come with that. And I've been very vocal about that over the years in any of the poems I've, I've written or performed. Um, and, you know, I do a lot of, I do a lot of performing. I have some published work, but much of my body of work is for the stage. And um, I feel like the stage is a, an example of a vulnerable place to be. Also just putting your work out in general in, a, in where anyone can read it or hear it is a, is a vulnerable thing, but it's also, you know, a human thing. If, if we have something we want to share um, and if someone wants to pick it up and, and, and feel something through it or learn something from it, that's just like the great part about writing and the arts in general. Um, I forgot about that line, the, that fragility is like, 
standing under a thatched roof and getting rained on. Mm -hmm. I think when I put out that book, it's, um, I would, I was feeling that even more than normal. Um, like not that I'm not feeling fragile now, especially on the end of two years of a pandemic and on the state of the, the world, um, pandemic aside, there's a lot of things going on. So there's a lot to be, for, to feel vulnerable about, uh, vulnerable about all the time. But when I wrote that poem, I know that I was in dealing with um, other kinds of heartbreak and relationship heartbreak and, uh, just some more angst that I've not like necessarily solved, but have sort of put down a little bit at this stage in my life. I don't feel as lonely and as angsty and maybe I don't feel as fragile. Um, I'm still, of course, as vulnerable as anybody ever is. I could, you know, anything could happen. Um, but there was something that I built an identity a little bit on that sort of feeling. And like, I loved the idea of like, going out and not not being necessarily protected like the idea of a thatched roof it's like kind of like rain's getting getting through and that yeah depending on where you're at in the weather system that could be really bad or it could be kind of refreshing and it could like I don't know whether I like to talk about it and reference it because it is one of the things that I it's when I was a kid I used to think it was so boring hearing old people talk about weather and now I'm like well weather is like one of the things we can all relate to if we're in the same weather system then we have something in common and especially in this part of the world it's right i know it's a stable and it, conversation it's a staple conversation and i wonder if it is in all parts of the world because it is something that people can connect on and we're vulnerable to the weather and we're vulnerable to what the weather causes and and the climate and climate change of course so mm -hmm. but it also makes me feel particularly human and alive and like there's not much i can do about it and it's it's understandable that we're fragile but it's also something beautiful so yeah it's a long-winded answer to your question but I definitely think about fragility and vulnerability a lot and especially at that time of my life which was I don't know maybe it was 10 years ago um, that I wrote that poem or I thought about it even more so mm. yeah it's a it's a it's a fascinating take on what see yeah what we think of as a mundane topic the weather but it's yeah there's a lot of emotion wrapped up in it as well yeah. um an, another theme i picked up on in your work was gills um i mean one poem very explicitly deals with elapsed catholic um but also i i personally felt how to be alone which is probably your best known um individual piece um was kind of a a reassurance that it's okay to be on your own and and Part of that seems like a response to the fact that we feel guilty about being alone often, or we feel like something's wrong with us or we're not doing it right. Um, and then another really, uh, a poem I loved was Rugby Made Me Gay. Um, and then how you kind of hilariously just flip off any sense of guilt um, and somewhat sarcastically and refusing to apologize for who you are, no matter what other people may say or what judgments people may put on you. Um, and sometimes societal forces do kind of impose guilt on us just for being ourselves. And I think queer people are probably very familiar with that notion and that feeling. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about your relationship with guilt and outside pressures that society puts on you and, and how you respond to that in your work. Yeah, absolutely. I have had a long, long standing relationship with guilt, and um, it is informed a lot by my. Uh, growing up Catholic um, and then letting that go and, and dealing with dealing with the repercussions of it. And I don't think I'm the only Catholic who <laughs> carries guilt around years after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like a, a joke. I don't think just Catholics. I've heard like Jewish people talk about guilt and it's like a religious thing. Um, mm -hmm. it, it kind of unfortunately comes with it because um, if there's a lot that you can get wrong if you're trying to um, follow follow dogma or follow uh, religious institutions, and um, so I, I did have a lot of I did have a lot of guilt when I was wrestling with being a queer person but still being Catholic. So because I didn't realize I was queer until a bit later, um, and I was still practicing, and it, it was a conundrum for me because I honestly thought that. Um, it was wrong. So I had a lot of internalized homophobia and, um, mm. and that was, that was a real struggle for me. Luckily it wasn't a long struggle. I kind of like my life sort of changed and unraveled really quickly or unraveled like in a nice way. Mm. Um, so 
I, I did struggle with, with the guilt of it. And then I had to struggle with letting go of that guilt. And in a way I didn't want to, because I don't know, I, in the same way that maybe I got some identity out of thinking about vulnerability or fragility, I got something out of feeling like guilt or the angst of being a lapsed Catholic and a queer lapsed Catholic at that. I, I, I wrote a lot of material about that. Um, I'm still kind of parsing through it, but it's a lot softer now, years later. Um, but I do think a lot of queer people, or at least queer people that I've talked to have struggled with that, especially if they came from religious backgrounds, um, or if there's any sort of divide between them and their family. Luckily, um, I have a great relationship with my family, although when I came out, it was hard, um, because my mother is very Catholic, and so she had, you know, a, a real fear about it, like, well, if my kid is queer, then what's going to happen to them, like a genuine sadness and, and, and fear. And I can understand that objectively. Um, and I feel for people who, who, who worry for their children um, based on their religion. Uh, but as I, as I wrestled with my own guilt, I also, like you said in the poem, Rugby Made Me Gay, I think it's because somebody thought um, that rugby maybe made me gay. Like they asked me, was it rugby? Like, because you played rugby, is that why you're gay? Which sounds kind of ridiculous, but also they were serious. <laughs> and so <laughs> I wrote a poem about it that's kind of um, in, in jest and sarcasm, but also like a, you know, maybe rugby did have parts of it because it was a rough and tumble sport and I got to hang out with lots of women who were, some of them were also queer. So it was like very formative to me and I'm not going to blame it on rugby, <laughs> um, not, <laughs> but you know, and even, even the fact that I just said that blame it on, like there's still like guilt just weaves its way in, even if we don't want it to. Um, but that poem was just a response. It's like, that's ridiculous. Like I'm a queer person because I'm a queer person, not because I went played rugby, not because I was in the church or not. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely guilt has long reaching tentacles that sticks around for a long time. And I think I've had many conversations with, with people, especially queer people, but in general that it's hard to let go of. It's hard to let yeah. go of. I I don't know exactly why, but just identity is sticky. Yeah, and I mean the influence of religion is very strong, and I I think it's that way in many places. But um, I've always felt that Atlantic Canada seems to be a particularly pious part of the world, or part of Canada anyway, relative to the rest of Canada. It feels like sometimes, and so that's. Um, a strong force of, of guilt in, in our lives and especially for anyone who's quote unquote different you know from from what's expected by the church exactly yeah speaking of Atlantic Canada um, you are from PEI and you're living there now yep. um, and you spent a lot of time in Halifax who the poet laureate here for two years um, I really was struck um, by your poem made in Canada um, which was about your travels all across the country. And there's a line in there 18 times in four years, going by thumb, hitchhiking, motorcycle, however you could get where you needed to go, um, exploring the country, um, which I hadn't known about, um, that you had done that. And um, it just made me really think about you as someone, I've always associated you with this region a lot, although I knew you would lived in Montreal and elsewhere, but um, I wondered how you saw yourself that way. Do you see yourself as an Atlantic Canadian person or do you more identify as Canadian or does that even affect you at all? Nationalism or geography or, or what? Yeah, interesting. I don't, um, I don't feel very patriotic um, or, or nationalistic. I think maybe uh, I, I might've, again, when I was younger, I wrote that poem, there was a CBC uh, thing I can't even remember what it was called but poetry face off and they mm. gave people they gave poets across across the country a topic and we all wrote on that topic so that the year that I participated the topic was made in Canada um, I don't think I would have maybe called a poem made in Canada or considered myself being made in Canada um, because you know though I'm, I'm I'm grateful to live here I'm not somebody who like waves a flag um, by any means and I definitely have some critical thoughts about nationalism and our, and our country. Um, and it's complex because, you know, I get healthcare and I get to live here and there's lots of, of course, wonderful things. Um, but that, that it was given, that we were given that topic, 
I love I love getting words, guiding words to write by. Um, I love a parameter. I love just something to kind of box in my thoughts because of course you could write about anything and that's a little overwhelming um, for me. Um, I'm not that focused. <laughs> so, so it's nice to have an instructive, like, okay, made in Canada, go. And when I was thinking about that and I was thinking about um, the country, I just recall about how there is some part of me that was formed by all that traveling that I did. And it wasn't like traveling necessarily for joy or, or sightseeing. It just sort of, uh, I was maybe, maybe I was seeking and searching something that included myself and what I wanted to do and where I wanted to be. Um, and at one point I hitchhiked to the West coast with a friend for kind of like for, for something to do in the summer, um, when we were young and I ended up staying there for four years sure. and, um, and in, in that time came back a little bit, like I said, on, I took a motorcycle trip with my ex-girlfriend. I took a bus. I took all this stuff back and forth. And eventually the pull for the East Coast got me. So maybe there is, yes. there is something in me that is like Atlantic, Atlantic Canadian or East Coaster identified that I, I love this ocean more. And I remember when I was living in BC, I really wanted to want to live in BC. Like I wished that that was my, my center or that was my home or maybe where my family was um, because it's so majestic out there and it's so beautiful and I love it so much. Um, and, but actually something called me back. It seems like such a cliche, but it, so I was almost disappointed in myself to fall for it. And when I moved back to PEI, it was just before COVID. I never thought I'd move back to PEI. Um, I was all, I was one of those people who I turned 18 and I left. And of course, some of that was informed by being a queer person in a small place and feeling really mm -hmm. stifled here. And like, I was too different and I didn't fit in. And um, so I spent most of my time living in cities and I never thought I'd move back. And, and then I did. <laughs> and so it's, it's interesting, like there's something about the East Coast for East Coasters, I guess that, um, it's the air, it's the ocean, um, it's the, the people here. Um, mm. But yeah, I guess now I would consider myself pretty rooted in Atlantic Canada. I, I feel very at home here and uh, I like to leave when I can, um, but I always tend to come back. Yeah, we do tend to come back. <laughs> it, it, it reminds me of, um, I hitched my way to Big Sur in California when I was in my mid twenties. And uh, I called my dad from there thinking it'd be really cool to like from a payphone back then when they existed. Yeah, yeah, right. And I think it'd be really cool to talk to my dad on a payphone, a big sir. And, and he was like, Oh yeah, we went there once. Uh, it's beautiful there. It's no Cape Breton, but it's nice. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, I came all this way for an upgrade. <laughs> uh -oh. yeah, yeah. You know? So, and it's, I mean, big sir is amazing, but Cape Breton is also amazing when you think of it. Mm -hmm. From an outsider's point of view, it's yeah. It's, and if you leave for a while and come back, and you get to see something through um, like fresh eyes again, uh, more objectively instead of. And I think I I really do encourage lots of people, especially young people, to leave uh, if they can. I mean, it's such a privileged viewpoint because obviously we can leave and come back. We have freedom of return. There's no war or border closures. Like um, that has to be put into context. Um, yeah. But here, say in the example of you know people I know, young people on Prince Edward Island who are like oh I don't know go to university do I'm always like you should yeah go somewhere and then maybe you'll come back but definitely like explore live somewhere else just for comparison I mean some people don't need to and they're happy to be in one place their whole lives and that that is if that works for them that's also great um but people who are searching especially young like when I'm thinking of like young queer kids I'm like you gotta go and you might then appreciate this this place too but like there's other other things to see and just to have a perspective that um yeah I think it helps with open open-mindedness and um just like a better a better life in a, in a long view um mm. I mean it's maybe not for everyone but for lots of us <laughs> yeah 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 it just has that pullback factor yeah. um you know I your work is is I'd say relentlessly positive really but at the same time I really sense and I sense it in talking to you as well um there's this humility but also awareness 
of injustice in the world. You've said a few times like how lucky we are to have what we have here and that awareness that not everybody has that. Um, and I know also, I happen to know that you do a lot of work on diversity and inclusion issues in the arts community. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about that side of yourself as an activist and what drives that and, and where that comes from. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I do do some work on um, diversity and inclusion, inclusion initiatives um, on, on boards and committees and stuff. I, I hesitate to, to call myself an activist. Like I, I wish I was more of an activist and I, I really admire people who are working tirelessly and, and openly um, and vocally in, in social activism. And I think that um, when, I was, when I was younger, um, I definitely like tried to find my, my way to be an activist. Um, and at the time that was going to large protests and demos and marches. And, um, and I still go to protests and demos and marches sometime, but I always felt like that wasn't quite my, um, my best way to contribute. Um, and I sort of kind of come to activism now or to social justice work through, through writing and through performing um, in a way that is, I guess, kind of soft. Like there have definitely been times when I wished I could be stronger and, and be less worried about upsetting anybody or I've always been kind of diplomatic. Um, I'm a Leo in the way of a cliche. I want people to like me, I, I am soft. Um, but I think that I've kind of found my way through that to try to, my approach, I guess, is to try to highlight things in a way that that people can understand from different sides. Um, and maybe that is a little bit of a, I don't, I'm not, not exactly cowardly, but uh, sometimes I worry that it might be because I, I wanna make sure that, you know, I'm not pushing anybody over, I'm not repelling anyone. Um, but I think at the same time, my approach for that is because it's, it's a, I'm trying to connect ultimately. And I think through connection, our ideas and our, um, our fights for social justice can have an impact. Um, if people, because if people are, are too in conflict and, and yelling at each other, like say the recent trucker convoy protests, I'm worried about that all the time because I was trying to find ways to speak about it because people are so riled up so quickly that no one's going to listen. And so my approach with social justice work and my, my writing is to try and find a way in um, that's soft enough that I can just talk to somebody um, and, and maybe say something that if someone doesn't agree with at the outset, at least they'll like hear me out because I've, I've been, in, I've come in in an approachable way. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of that's that's important to me in just who I who I am as a person. I really think um, there's a lot of activism work that um, is is so powerful and strong and makes a lot of change. And then there's some that is like powerful and strong and unfortunately shuts conversations down. Um, and it takes all the ways. I mean, we need all of the ways to like help change the world and help um, alleviate suffering and and like challenge the systems that are that are making people suffer um, and my way is definitely um, yeah this sort of sort of a diplomatic uh, searching for a common ground sort of way or a universal truth so mm -hmm. that's usually how I weave my securitist route into like a, into an issue is um, softly <laughs> yeah yeah and I mean I see a lot of strength in that and you know you say you're you, the goal is to connect with people and you've always obviously done that um you know the popularity of particularly how to be alone but all your work your music uh your spoken word um, your books all that is clearly found a mark with people and i think a lot of i don't know people who were who needed it heard those messages and i think you know that's kind of there's an uplifting of the downtrodden or the underdog in that and there's there's great strength there and I think it's a really good fit with this project that we're doing because um, that's what we're asking you to do is make a connection with people in conversation and kind of elevate them and amplify their uh, their voices as well um, I wondered if you could talk a bit about that and um, where you see voices fitting in with your work um, and what you hope to 
what you hope happens or comes from these um, conversations or, or interviews that you'll be doing? Absolutely. Um, well, I just love, first of all, that the project is happening and um, that, you know, to amplify diverse voices is, you know, so important now and always. Um, and I feel, you know, lucky to get to be a part of it. Um, I love conversation. I love talking with with writers and with um, queer writers in, in my community and the people I'll be talking to, you know, I might know a couple of them a little bit, but but mostly I don't. So it's like new conversations for me, um, new connections to be made. And I think that, um, I yeah, I think that we, we're lucky in the world of writing and publishing nowadays that there are more books being published by more um, diverse community, people from communi diverse communities than mm -hmm. ever before. And that's sort of changing the industry. And I'm so glad because I, you know, even when I was in high school, if I wanted to find a book by a, a queer author or a black author or like an immigrant writer in my hometown bookstore, it just would have been, there would have been there, but not as many. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just, there's a lot more visibility now for just that represents the world that we live in. Like there, these people, there's always been lots of people around, but only small amounts of their stories have been published. And now I, I feel really lucky to be in a time where there's all kinds of um, books available to read. Um, and of course, you know, there's still gatekeepers in the publishing industry is not perfect, just like lots of industries. But I think that a campaign like this is highlighting the, the directions that we're going and how we are changing. Um, and that there's more space being made and more people just stepping into the spaces, like not waiting for space to be made necessarily, but just like, here I am, here's my story. I want, let's talk about it. And I also like the idea, um, you know, queer writers, are sometimes writing about queer issues and sometimes not. They're just queer people who are writing. And mm -hmm. I'd love to have those discussions uh, too. And I know that right now there's lots of opportunity to self-identify um, from being a, as being a member of a marginalized community. Um, and I think that's important that we're keeping um, track in a way and, and so that we can know statistically like how many writers of color are being published, how many queer um, writers are getting stages um, but also I, I like to think that, you know, queer writers don't just have to write about queer things. Um, and if they do, awesome. And it's just, I think it's a really exciting time to be a writer and to be reading, to be a reader is just like so rich. And I'm really excited to uh, hear what the authors we're gonna speak with like have to say about, uh, about their lives, about their practices. Um, I don't even know what we're gonna get up to talking about, but. I, uh, I love that we have this platform and that we, we can spread these voices out and people can listen. Yeah, it's part of the fun of it. You never know where the conversation is going to go exactly. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I just want to say thank you so much for doing this today and thank you so much for doing this project with us. Really excited to see what you come up with and, and to share the, the videos and, and those voices. With our audience and beyond, if possible. So, Same. thank you very much. Jane. Thanks, Chris. All right.